Hello and welcome to another episode of Stepping Up. I'm your host, Danielle Dubois. This week, we join the St. Lucia Cadet Corps at their opening ceremony and shine a light on the organization. And for Link Up, we head to Atlanta, Georgia to chat with young St. Lucian pilot, Tevin Belasco. The cadet movement was introduced to St. Lucia on July 13, 1929, when a unit was established at the St. Mary's College. Its formation was significant, instilling the highest possible level of discipline and character building in the society. The cadets at the time were engaged mainly in drill and route marches, as well as attending national parades and camps. The Cadet Corps aims to inspire young people to achieve success in life with a spirit of service to country and their local community, and to develop in them qualities required of a good citizen. Let's take a look at the interview with Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Hyacinth as I joined him at Nemo headquarters for the official opening of the Cadet Year and Commandant's Parade. So let me know what is it that you guys did today that we are so blessed to see. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, this, this session today was the opening of the cadet year. The cadet program has been suspended since the outbreak of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, so the cadets have been out of circulation since um, February. Mm -hmm. And this year we've opened up, um, since school has reopened, so the mm -hmm. cadet program has um, recommenced. Mm -hmm. And so we are um, trying to bring all the cadets together. So this morning session happened with the first battalion, where that is the cadets from, from the valley come up to Grosley. Okay. So from all of those schools, those units, those cadets have gathered together today um, to signal the opening of the cadet year. Mm -hmm. all right. So um, all the officers, the cadets, we have come together with we'll just um, <coughs> welcome each other back and we are trying our best to see how we can put our programs together um, also recognizing the COVID-19 um, restrictions that are put in place yeah. and so we definitely have to. Well you mentioned that you guys were out of commission from since um, when you said March or February but I know that you guys are very instrumental with some of the programs in terms of um, bringing out um, good food boxes, the Nemo packages in the earlys. Um, Tell me a little bit about how the Cadet Corps came in and was able to support these governmental um, initiatives. All right, the, the Cadet Corps actually is mandated by law where we, uh, are chep we, are the we hold the chairmanship of the Supplies Committee of NEMO. Okay. Now I sit in that chair as the chairman of that committee and the Cadet Corps also <coughs> assists in sending out volunteers in the, um, the packing of food items and to, to di the distribution of food items. So the Supplies Committee is all about receiving and the distribution of supplies during a disaster um, for St. Lucia. So as an organization, we fall nicely into that um, aspect of NEMO, where our adults, so our adults were active. However, the cadets, the young cadets, those at secondary school level, they were not active. Okay. okay so those, those adults, we came together to assist NEMO um, within that capacity of supplies, mm -hmm. where we were able to um, help it and receive and to distribute island-wide of food items during the pandemic. Now you mentioned that um, Cadet Corps has an adult and I didn't know that I thought Cadets was always just about secondary school students but I guess those who stay with the group, um, um, stay with the Corps and they go up, they, once a Cadet, always a Cadet, right? True and also the, the adults really are for the, the adult rank. So we have from the warrant officers, we're okay. all up to the officer, um, officer level. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones we put out into the extreme conditions. Mm -hmm. We will not put the younger cadets out into extreme conditions. Um, although sometimes the younger cadets are used for sitting down at headquarters to help pack up items. Yeah. So uh, for instance, when the hurricanes come in, they were there at headquarters and they were the ones who were packing the flour, the rice and the sugar mm -hmm. and these things. But they don't go so out. So you still utilize them? We do utilize them, but they don't go out um, into the, the mm -hmm. public um, or into hazardous areas. We don't send them out in this. We only use the adults for that purpose. Tell us a little bit about the mandate of the St. Lucia Cadet Corps and you know that place that you guys serve nationally in terms of youth engagement. All right, so the Cadet Corps this year actually celebrates um, 92 years. So on the 14th of July, we, we did celebrate 92 years in San Lucia. Um, we yeah, thank you. you. Didn't get to celebrate that no, we didn't get to celebrate it um, this <laughs> because year because of COVID. Uh, because of COVID, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. um, we operate at um, 20 secondary schools around the island. Um, our mandate is youth development, and we use the military 
um, platform in order to do that. So we're not saying that we are soldiers, we're not, but however we use the military platform in order to instill what we have as our motto. Our motto really is leadership, discipline and service. So we're saying that anyone who has come through the organization should emit those values. We have the values, they will be leaders, they would have discipline, and they, they definitely think about service and helping others out. And so that's what we're trying to um, instill in our young men and women um, in society. Now, apart from that, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have been mandated in order to serve um, within the arms of NEMO. Our main purpose is as the chairmanship of the supplies committee. However, our credit officers also shadow all of the other subcommittees of NEMO. So we have shadow officers who sit within all the committees. Very soon, we are hoping that we can get enough credit officers who also sit at the disaster, the community disaster level so that they will be able to assist within, um, the, um, constituencies. within the constituencies. Okay. But we are not there yet, so we're hoping to get there very soon. Okay, so we're hoping that um, as an organization, mm -hmm. we continue that mandate that we have, and we, we are looking to see how best that we can continue to serve St. Lucia within the capacity that we have. St. Lucia is quite unique. Yeah. We're not like all of the other islands in the Caribbean, those, especially those who have defense forces. Yeah. So the defense forces really are the ones taking the lead. Mm -hmm. But in St. Lucia, we don't. So yeah. St. Lucia, the credit core really takes the lead in that. Mm -hmm. So anything having to deal with disasters, anything having to do with that, we are here with NEMO, yeah. as the volunteers for NEMO, in order to assist them in moving forward. So as we conclude the interview, let us know what's next for the St. Lucia Cadet Corps with the whole advent of COVID? Right, um, COVID has put us in a unique situation where we are not able to meet face-to-face -face as we normally do. So what we have decided to do is to, we are going to break up our meeting time. So we look at two Saturdays a month where we will be meeting face-to-face. -face. However, everything else is going to be done online. Um, <clears throat> we have recently had contact with a, a donor let's put it this way, he was offering computers. Um, not only just the computers, he's a software um, engineer, engineer yeah. and he wants to be able to supply St. Lucia youngst um, youngsters with both computers and with the, the knowledge of how to build computers and also how to develop software. So he's willing to volunteer in St. Lucia. So he has chosen the St. Lucia Credit Corps as one of the agencies that he's, he wants to work with. So hopefully we'll be setting up some computer labs at headquarters mm -hmm. and that our credits will be able to use. And we're also having available cheap computers, well, I shouldn't say cheap computers, L computers at lower value yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. in cost mm -hmm. so that um, the, the credits can, can use. So we're working with our ministry. I've mentioned it in word to ministry officials, but I will be writing officially to let them know so that at least and we can get the, the program yes. That you guys want to spearhead. Um, I said we were concluding, but I, I can't forget that um, earlier this year that you guys were selected to um, receive support from proceeds raised from the Prime Minister's Ball as part of independence um, celebrations. So let us know um, how you guys felt about that and what plans do you have for the support that you received? Oh yes, we are very grateful to the, the Prime Minister and the, the um, members of the Prime Minister's Ball and the agencies who are involved in actually selecting the credit core as one of the donors um, to receive um, mm -hmm. that, that funding. This fund is actually earmarked into getting uniform supplies for our cadets. And if you notice, um, we, there are a number of cadets on that opening period without headgears. Yeah. So they didn't have barriers and badges. So that's one of the areas that we're looking at. So you're looking at barriers and badges and belts. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, I received the invoice yesterday, as a matter of fact, for 200 sets of barriers um, and badges. That really went a lot more than <laughs> what the Prime Minister's uh, <laughs> donation was. Yeah. However, um, hopefully that will get a part of the subvention that we have received. Yeah. We will definitely will be um, able to at least get the 200. Um, in some way later, we will get yeah. that done. So um, it will be a thing of the past that you will see colors with art barriers. It's something that has disturbed me tremendously yeah. to see colors of dress halfway, walk in the streets <laughs> without um, the proper attire. Yeah. So hopefully um, that donation is going to go very um, um, well into putting uh, getting our cadets dressed adequately. Yeah. So, Lieutenant Colonel, do you have any final words for us as we end our session today? Um, I'd like to say one thank you for, 
for recognizing the Cadet Corps and bringing us out into the spotlight. Mm -hmm. I think um, the Cadet Corps, um, well, as I put it to my officers, we were one of the best kept secrets in Saint Lucia. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is high time that we get out in the public and people get to know us, who yeah. we are, what is it that we do. And not only that you see us during disaster times, but we do quite a bit more. We do a lot of flag raising ceremonies. Um, for instance, our Cadets raise the flags every any, any anniversary at OECS, you will find our cadet officers or cadets there raising the flags at OECS for any anniversary. Yeah. Our cadets do many other flag um, protocols. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of volunteering. We do a well. lot of volunteer there. work. Volunteering. Okay, and we need mm -hmm. to be recognized for who we are. Um, mm -hmm. For 92 years in Sanusha, mm -hmm. um, that's a big secret. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm hoping that um, persons get to know a lot more about us. And our parents, I'd like to thank them for at least choosing the cadet corps um, as one of the avenues to have their children. Um, to be part of mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that we continue to, to meet the expectations of everyone and we're asking them asking the public to help us you know to, for us to meet our expectations so again I'd like to thank you for choosing us um, for this interview mm -hmm. and for bringing us out there in the public. Well we're always very grateful where we could get to speak to these things that are so very important and have always been a part of St. Lucia's social fabric so I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity and the fact that you said yes, that we got to catch this interview because, you know, the weather was a little bit iffy this morning. So I just want to say thank you and continue to step up. Thank you very much. <laughs> We'll be right back. COVID-19 is a new pandemic disease as declared by the World Health Organization. It is transmitted directly by respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs or sneezes or indirectly through rubbing the face with contaminated hands. There is still no specific treatment or vaccine against COVID-19, and as such, the farming community should adhere to some special recommendations. Limit the number of crew members to only essential persons. Practice frequent hand washing and cleaning of all boat surfaces. Limit contact with the public, keeping a safe distance between each person. Limit unnecessary conversation with customers and pairs during the sale of fish. Wash hands frequently with soap and running water or use 60 to 95% alcohol-based hand sanitizer until water and soap are available. Sneeze and cough in a flexed elbow or into a tissue, immediately discarding the used tissue into a bin and wash hands with soap and water or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer until soap and water is available. And avoid close contact with persons having respiratory symptoms. More than ever before, your important role as gatekeepers of St. Lucia's nutritional health and food security should be taken seriously. When you exercise these precautions, you not only safeguard your health, but also continue to allow all St. Lucians access to freshly caught fish and other seafood. Remember, it is our responsibility to ensure our nation eats fresh, St. Lucia's best. Welcome back. The St. Lucia Cadet Corps has really cemented its place in St. Lucia. And I just want to say thank you to Lieutenant Colonel Hyacinth and his team for pressing on with the mandate. Thank you so much and keep stepping up. This next segment, I chat with two very young, enthusiastic cadet members. Let's take a look. Welcome back, guys. So right now, I want to feature a few members of the St. Lucia Cadet Corps. And right now, I'm here with Aquila. Right? So can you just tell me what is your full ranking and your full name? Introduce yourself for the, the audience, please. Okay. Good day, everyone. My name is Aquila Smith. Um, in cadets, I am Warrant Officer Class 2, Smith A um, of Battalion 1. So does that mean like you're the highest in the rank? I'm the highest you can get, yes, as a cadet. before you reach officer, yes, as a junior cadet. Yeah. So how long again until you reach, you pass that? I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you want to be. The next transition is to go to an officer, which is more teaching yeah. than instructing, more than less drill and the uh, physical aspect of, aspect of it and training the cadets. Mm -hmm. So I'm not looking to move forward. I'll stay there as long as they let me. When I joined cadets, my father was a warrant officer and he had to go because I joined, so oh. I can stay here for a long time. <laughs> and that's good. So you enjoy that aspect mm -hmm. of it. So let us know how long have you been in cadets and what was your interest? Why why cadets? As a young girl as well, too. Okay, so I've been cadets since 2011 when I joined in Form 1, secondary school. Mm -hmm. um, I joined because of my parents. Both my mother and my father were part of cadets. My mother rejoined after I joined. So it was always in our families the next step. All of us, all my brothers and them, 
we all join Kedis. It's always the next step. That's what we are going to do. It doesn't matter. We have a choice. <laughs> um, as a girl, I don't think there's a difference. Like in Kedis, you're just a cadet. You're a soldier. That's right. There's not a... <laughs> The disparities, like that, yeah, yes. distinction. Okay. The distinction is what barrack room you're in. That's the end of it. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, as a cadet, what is it that you've learned? Um, as a cadet, I think it's to be more than a civilian. You're not part of the military. You almost you semi-military. So you walk different. You look different. You act different. You have different principles that you keep. It just makes you more disciplined, more of a well-rounded member of society as a whole. So even if the lowest cadet, the one that did not do very well. They are a better person than, or they have a, they're more rounded, they have a better chance of being a well, more well-rounded citizen than an average citizen, I should say. Yeah. Nice. So as we conclude, let me know what was probably your most exciting activity as a cadet. I know that you guys do some amazing things, you all work throughout the whole COVID shutdown. Well, I remember seeing you packing <laughs> flour and sugar. Um, but I know before that, you know, tell us what, what, what comes to mind when you have to think about your best experience as a cadet? Uh, my best experience? I don't want to say shooting because that's cliche. All cadets' favorite part is shooting. <laughs> but the best part, honestly, is obstacle courses and the different FTX and um, activities. So that's like physical challenges that they mm. give cadets. But it's, it's the, another level when you go to another country and they have full military bases that you can train on and you can do these mm -hmm. little um, challenges on. Have you ever been able to travel? Yes, to I've traveled three times. One where I was leading the team. But mm -hmm. yeah. Where did you go? I went to Barbados the first time I traveled. And the next time I went to Jamaica, mm -hmm. and the last time I went back to Barbados with another contingent, mm -hmm. another contingent of credit. But the best part is the is the physical um, challenges, the different um, competitions they put us in between each other. Physical, like I cannot do pull-ups, but it's more than just that. It's running and this and relying on your teammates mm -hmm. and stuff like that, finding objectives. So it's it's everything, mental and physical. Mm -hmm. How excited are you as the school year was finally able to um, open, and what's next? I'm looking forward to the new, the new classes and the increased material that we'll have, especially as we move in more to online teaching and stuff like that. I'm looking forward to more of the academics part of cadets taking part, because we'll not be able to do drill as usual mm -hmm. because of the amount of cadets we have, so it'll be mainly classes and stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. We're going to have something new. We're going to have new things to teach the younger cadets and new experiences to make that will be different than what I experience, what other people experience. It'll be a new form, a new breed of cadets. Wow. You're making me feel like I want to join cadets now. <laughs> well, okay. well, thank you so much, darling, and keep stepping up, okay? What's, what's the full, the full um, <laughs> class um, that you're in? A warrant officer class 2, Smith E. All right. Thank you very much. No <laughs> so we have it for another cadet, and I would allow him to introduce himself. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Lance Corporal Mondesi J. I've been in the Corps for nearly three years. I joined in 2017. And, yeah, basically, I have a love and hate relationship with cadets. <laughs> yeah, because basically, you know, you love the uniforms. You know, you like the status. Well, not really a status, but like, you know, people looking up to you. There's a prestige that comes with yes, it, yes. Yes, But at the same time, it's the physical work. <laughs> you know, the high demand. <laughs> you know, they expect you to be disciplined all the time. Mm -hmm. A lot of us disciplined all the time. But, yeah, so... But you enjoy that though, nonetheless. Yeah, of course I enjoy it, you know, because at the same, at the end of the day, you don't have, you have the, you have a higher, you know, what would they call it? Confidence. Um, not confident, Respect. but you, know, <laughs> you have like a higher liberty like other children would, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know more, like, you, let's say, you, you know more stuff in the military. Yeah. You, and survival skills. Yes, for survival skills, so let's yeah. say, in, let's say, um, Iran on, you know, Trump. Something happens in St. Lucia, you know? We know how to survive. <laughs> it's true. So tell us, um, what made you join cadets in the first place, though? Well, basically, I... I drank it because, you know, I was inspired, you know, I like to see, like, the U.S. Army and the British Army. I've always, like, been inspired by them. And, like, when I joined, when I came in secondary school, I found out they are cadets. I said, wow, they are cadets. And I just instantly joined because I already love the military. I love everything, too. Well, you know, if you love it, you know you have to love the hard work, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about, um, let me know what was your most exciting experience as a cadet with your, your short stint compared to other persons here, three years, right? Well, one of my best experiences was, was Independence Parade, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're like a peacock, you know, you're looking nice, you know, marching, everybody looking at you, everybody clapping, you know what they told us, they told us people don't come 
to see the police officers much. They only see, they come to see us much, the That's cadets. Right. That's and that right. makes that, you know, boost your ego a little bit, you know? <laughs> it boosts your ego a little bit. So, uh, so yeah. as you conclude, what would you tell your friends to tell them to join? What is what, what would you say to them to say, hey guys, join the cadet corps? You know, there's a lot of like conspiracy thing. They're going to drop you in a forest and leave you there for three days. That is not true. <laughs> that is not true. Just, just, you know, anybody that going current, you all know me. If you're, if you're afraid to join, come and ask me questions, okay? That's right. If, don't be afraid to join, can they? Yes, they'll shout at you. Know, <laughs> yeah, you'll be able to do a little push-up and thing. But it, it'll get you stronger. <laughs> but me right now, I, I can't do push-ups because the summer get me with COVID and... So you you get there, you get there. All right, well, so thank you so much. I was I enjoyed this interview passionately. The passion, though. So do you think it's something that you'll grow up and you'll probably you want to go? Because yeah, my mother told me as soon as I leave school, I joined the I joined the SSU. So. All right, so you know you have to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no joking around. Yes. Well, thank you so much, darling, and continue mm -hmm. all the good work. Wash your hands. Wash them right. With soap and lots of water. Get between fingers. Get under the nails. Go above the wrists. Do this for no less than 15 seconds. Rinse properly. Dry with a clean towel. If there is no water, do the same washing motions with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer containing at least 70% alcohol. Wash your hands. Wash them right. This message brought to you courtesy the Bureau of Health Education of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Now it's time for Link Up. This week we chat with Tevin Belasco, a St. Lucian pilot who is immensely proud to share his story and says that anyone can achieve and soar to greater heights once they work hard, persevere and don't give up. He recently celebrated a major milestone in his career and shares with us his story. Tevin, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing good, thanks, Il. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay holding on. So I know recently you and another St. Lucian pilot celebrated a really important milestone, not only for St. Lucia, but the U.S. Um, so that's why I felt it was, you know, kind of prudent to reach out to you. Um, but let's start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your childhood and your love for aviation. My name is Stephen Belasco. I was born and raised in Granivia, Grosely. I attended the um, Anakin Infant School, then went on to the Anakin Primary School, then later on went to the Bocash Secondary School. After um, completing my five years at Bocash, I went to the South Africa West Community College DTEMS Division to study building trades. And after building trades, then I pursued my uh, career in uh, aviation in Atlanta, Georgia. So my, my childhood was very, I was a very family oriented person. My, my parents always showed equal love to both of my, my brother and myself and always told us we could achieve anything that we wanted to be. So that really pushed me to achieve becoming a pilot. Nice. And what was the journey like? Um, you say you, so you're a pilot. So after you left school and you started your journey, what did you have to do to be able to get accredited or, you know, trained, etc.? Let us know about that aspect of it. Yeah, so my interest in aviation began at a very tender age where my mother and I used to visit my father very often in Trinidad. And every time I get onto the airplane, I always used to stick my head inside of the cockpit to wonder what these guys were doing up there and what it was like to actually be flying up there. So... Later on throughout the years, my godmother introduced me to um, Sylvanus Ernest, which is also known as Squeezy. And he invited me to his hangar at George Charles Airport to get a hands-on experience of how the airplanes operate. And from there, that's where my interest in aviation began. And you know how, long, how old were you um, when that happened? Uh, during that time I was going by Sylvanus Ernest, I was in secondary school. Okay, yeah, I was in public form two, form three. Mm -hmm. And then how did it continue to grow? And it continued to grow by taking, just decided I wanted to go to flight school and stop procrastinating. And I actually you know this is what I wanted to become. So I moved to um, Atlanta, Georgia by my aunt and visited a couple of flight schools. And that's where I went to flight school. So when I started flight school in 2015, uh, I started uh, becoming a private pilot, 
where you get the basic fundamentals down, then you do your check right. So I actually became a, a private pilot from there. And then I went on to do um, my instrument training where it's basically teach you to fly in, like blind in the clouds, low visibility in, in clouds, etc. And then I moved on to becoming a single, a commercial single engine pilot where now I can actually make money of being a pilot. After that, then I did my flight instructor certificate where I could now teach people how to fly and to become pilots. So I used that instructor license to build my time to 1500 hours, which is the requirement that uh, the US needs to go to an uh, airline. And that is where I am today as an airline pilot. 1500 or 15,000? What's it? 1500 hours. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And that's a lot in, 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 I guess, in aviation, the world. Yes, it's a, it's a lot of flying where I used to, when I was in shop, I used to fly eight hours a day, which was the limit you could have fly in a day teaching someone how to fly. Wow. Yeah, so it took me, it took me like one year to build from 250 hours to 1500 hours. It took me one year of nonstop working wow. to get to that. Are you there yet? What's, what's your hour count now? Right now, I'm at 2,150 hours. Nice. Yeah, so this is it's still small compared to others, but it's a good achievement right now, great achievement. Yeah. How do you, stupid question, how do you like clock your time? Does somebody do it for you or you do it yourself? No, basically it's uh, in the airplane, there is an in and out time where when the plane push back from the gate, when the, the parking brakes is released, that's when the time is start to, to, to count as your mm. flight. And then when the plane lands at the destination airport and goes into the gate and he puts the parking brakes, he sets the parking brakes, the captain sets the parking brakes, that's when the time stops. And then after when they, the doors open, it sends a report to us and tell us how long was the flight. So then afterwards you get that, it's almost like a, an online report every time you fly it will it will just accumulate right and, then, right and then i put it into my electronic logbook okay yeah so every pilot has an electronic logbook because every airline wants to see how much time that you have and that's how you determine to go to another airline is the amount of time that you right. have so tevin you tell me mm -hmm. You tell me now, sorry to cut you short, <laughs> you tell me now that you have a pilot license and you, you basically surpassed the 1500 hours. How, what's next for you? What's, what's the next goal, Tevin? Uh, my next goal is to reach to a thousand hours flying the jet that I fly, it's Embraer 175. Uh, so right now I have 560 hours in the plane. So when I get to a thousand hours, I'm eligible to upgrade to become a captain on this, on this um, aircraft. Nice. All right, all right. Okay, nice. So you want, you still interested in flying commercial? <laughs> Even though right that's now- That's the end goal. Yeah, that's the end goal. Even though the pandemic has hit us very hard where I almost lost my job. Right. And we had to go into agreement with the union where they, they, they decided to cut our pay by eight hours. Wow. So everybody could have kept their job and to avoid full loads. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So yeah, we as a company agreed that we're going to take a pay cut to keep everybody safe from getting full load. Yeah, that's true. So that at least it's the bare minimum and you just have to hold on until things get a little bit better, I guess. Exactly. All right. What message do you have for... St. Lucians or anyone who is young people in particular still figuring out what they want to do in life, seeing that, and I know your journey because I remember you used to always just go by, the, go by the airport and watch planes and we used to laugh at you. Uh, <laughs> we used to laugh at you. But you know what, Tevin, I always knew, like, you see that we meet, like, so obsessive planes, he, he will become a pilot. And you remember I always say, like, wow, like, I'm just so inspired by your journey. So... What, what do you have to tell young people who are still figuring out what it is that they want to do and how they get to it? Well, my advice for the young people is to find a career that they actually love. 
something that they're passionate about, you know, learn and master the trade. Find a mentor in that field that could help you get to your higher level in that field. You know, um, for example, like I went to Boca Secondary School and a lot of people said that people that go to that school won't become anything in life, you know, because of the bad reputation that they had at Boca Secondary School. So where I am today, it's because of perseverance and uh, being committed to one goal. Like you said, everybody knows from St. Lucia where I was obsessed with planes, where I was sitting by the fence all the in the hot sun watching the plane take off and land you know and you know it, it doesn't matter what school that you go to you know it's just you being determined and being focused so just stick to one thing in life and that you like you and to achieve it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um not to say to correct you but you know bocas i won't say bocas has a bad reputation but saint lucia has this thing like they grade schools according to prestige and stuff like that because you know i remember you going to back bocas so you're like really like a good success story so you should probably explore probably going back and like trying to do a little you know and to help and inspire i actually did what did you do I uh, actually did went back to Bocash. One of the teachers called me when I was actually coming home for like just four days and she told me if I would stop by by the school and I did. So I was in my full pilot uniform and, why, why, when, why, why? and, when, and when the other um, teachers saw me that they were teaching me back then, they was like so happy and amazed to see me like, Tevin, I can't believe that's you and you were full time yeah. pilot. And then literally I had to speak to one class and the teacher's like, no, you got to teach, um, talk to the whole form five. So they opened up the auditorium for me <laughs> to, teach, to talk to, the, to the, the, the children. So that was a good experience. I thought they were really inspired. Right. It doesn't matter like if you go to Bocash because they had the same perception thinking that when they come to Bocash, like they cannot become nothing in life. Yeah, so I think that's an important, an important um, um, point that you're making, Tevin. And how old are you? I, I'm, I hope you're not shy to say how old are you. <laughs> I'm 28. 28. Nice. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> so before we wrap up, just recently you celebrated a milestone, not only for St. Lucia, but the U.S., Tell us a little bit more about that. And we know that the Prime Minister gave you a little bit of a shout out. And you know, we're always watching because is it um, Kevin is the other guy? You know, you know, we follow you. I follow, I follow him. I follow you as, you know, when you have your, you know, your aerial photos and stuff like that. So let us know about the milestone and why is it so significant? Well, it was amazing. You know, flying with another solution in general is a dream come true. And, you know, there's not many of us in the U.S., especially flying at the same company. So flying with Kevin was just a matter of timing. I remember when I just uh, went into the company and I met Kevin. He was a first officer like myself. And he was just about to upgrade to become captain. And I was letting him know, like, man, you know how much fun it's going to be if the two of us actually flying a plane together as captain and first officer and say like man that's gonna be crazy <laughs> so it, it was an astonishing achievement to actually make it happen so soon after he upgraded to become captain so it was a unique experience you know i just want to clarify that we are not the only solutions flying in the u.s we are the first solutions to actually fly a plane together in the u.s i know i have a friend of mine named gianni he did the first flight i can remember with two he and another solution in the uk mm -hmm. so i just want to clarify that we are not the first solutions to ever do this we are the first ones to do it in the u.s with passengers nice well congratulations and i'm sure that has been i guess you manifested that because everything that you said you wanted to do you went ahead and you did it Evan. that is not yeah that is an amazing feat and like just want to say congratulations and all the best so before we wrap up do you have any final messages for us do you have any shout outs for your family back home i'm sure the belasco family is watching and they will be watching i want to say hello how are y'all <laughs> Because it's been so long. Yeah, so as you wrap up, what is it that you want to let St. Lucia know, Tevin? Yeah, like I said to the youth, just stay focused, stay determined. Um, 
stick to one goal and definitely push as much as you can to achieve it. Big shout out to my family, my parents, Lindy and Emma Belasco. Big shout out to my wife, Alasa Belasco. She's really been a tremendous help, especially when I'm not around and she's holding down the household for me as I'm on my four day trips. So big shout out to them and my family. Much love to everybody that been supporting me and that knew where I came from and where I'm at today because they saw how persistent I was standing by the fence um, in George Charles, <laughs> running down to view for to watch a certain plane land because of a special livery, uh, Sylvanus Ernest. Big shout out to Mr. Kirby Toussaint. Uh, he was the assistant general manager for um, George Charles Airport. He allowed me to to go to the the tower at George Charles. So yeah, if it wasn't for for him and Sylvanus, you know, pushing me. Yeah, and just getting that little opportunity of support. Yeah, definitely supporting my dreams from very tender. You know, Mr. Kobe Tosa always said, like, Tevin, I know you'd always become a pilot because you were so determined and so eager to learn the stuff where even though I was, my week was ended at the tower, I always used to call him and let him know, can I come back just to see the operation, how it's done. So, so big shout out to all of them. Tevin, I want to say thank you so much. St. Lucia is proud of you, and we look forward to welcoming you back home, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, it will be with another St. Lucia flying a, a bigger airline. It's going yes. to be a parade. And we it's have to come and look for you, HIA. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Interview from the plane when we land in the Uranora International Airport. That's right. So that's, that's, the, that's the next one. one. That's, that's the next thing. The next goal, thing. Yes. That's the next thing. Well, Tevin, thank you so much, and all the best. Thank you so much, Daniel. That's it for this week's installment of Stepping Up. Don't forget to send me an email at steppingup758 at gmail.com. Thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Daniel Dubois. Keep safe. See you next time. And until then, keep stepping up.